Genesis chapter 32. <clears throat> Tonight's chapter, um, I really like this chapter. I could probably read it over and over and over again. In fact, I probably have it pretty well in my head, the whole scenario with, with Jacob. Um, tonight's theme is ruled by God. And, and it's a name change that God does with Jacob, changing the name from Jacob to Israel, which basically means ruled by God. So he has a, a new name, and it becomes a picture, really, of his very character, ruled by God. Uh, I think that is a wonderful thing that takes place in the life of a believer is when God becomes the ruler of that believer. It changes uh, his whole life. And there's a lot uh, that is involved in naming someone. I don't know if you remember naming your children. I know we did picking out all kinds of names and you want to get the right name and so forth. But in this case, uh, God literally chose a name for, for Jacob that would last for centuries. And it really has as, as the nation Israel is still about today. <clears throat> names are important to us. We name our children. There's a story that I read recently about an adoption some parents who were adopting a child from Russia. And when the adoption was complete, they emailed everybody saying, we have adopted, and they, they went out and did this whole Russian name, and then they um, shared his new name with their last name. And, you know, they could have just easily said, yeah, he's here and he's our child, but they wanted to really impress that uh, his name was being changed from a Russian name to uh, an American name, and now this means something totally different for him. It's going to be a new beginning, a new life, a new situation, new parents, uh, hope, you know, all these wonderful things that happens and the names change. And I think we see that with Jacob from these chapters on. Three points tonight is fear cripples. Fear cripples. Fear cripples. A second point will be faith continues. We need to have faith that just continues on, that just plows through no matter what. And then also faith surrenders. It surrenders. So Jacob here encounters in verses 1 through 2 an angel. Now, as you remember, the story goes that Jacob just left Laban, who he's been serving for 20 years, and he's made a covenant with him never to return, uh, and they would never speak to each other again, and they would keep peace within the family. Laban's two daughters being with Jacob and his grandchildren. And now he's heading home to Jacob's uh, father's home, Isaac. And now he's realizing that I have to now confront Esau, my brother. Uh, I left in the first place because we had a disagreement over the birthright. I'd stolen it from him. And so Esau, being very angry, wanted to kill him, basically. So he took off to his family uh, there in um, Laban's home. And so 20 years later, he's gone on his way back to home and he meets this godly angel, verses one through two. And Jacob went on his way and the angel of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of the place Mehenim. So 20 years have gone by. He's on his way back to his father's house. Jacob meets this angel of God, and the angel may have been encouraging him on his way home. Uh, Hebrews tells us that they are not all ministering spirits sent, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who inherit salvation? And so these angels could have been ministering spirits ministering to Jacob as he's going home. And Jacob, being encouraged, names the place Mayhem. Mayhem means a place of two hosts. There was a host of Laban who were, who were going home and then the host of angels who had come to minister to Jacob. The place was situated between Mount Gilead and Jabbok near the banks of the brooks there. And so he's on his way there. God gives him a little encouragement. He's going to need it too as he deals with this whole scenario, and then his wrestling with God. And now verses 3 through 5, when Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, and he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dealt, I have dwelt with Laban, 
and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in his sight. So Jacob is dispatching some messengers to Esau uh, to let him know that he's coming. Jacob was in the land of Seir, which is Edom country. It was a high land country on the east side of the Dead Sea. It was while here that Jacob sent these messengers uh, to his brother Esau, hoping to find him at peace with their broken relationship. In front of him was Esau, who for all he knew was on a mission of revenge, hearing that he's coming back home. And behind him was Laban, who was also not pleased with Jacob. And Jacob commanded his servants, look, you need to go there. You need to be very respectful. I want you to share exactly as I say. You say to him, your servant Jacob, and make that very clear and underline. Your servant Jacob has dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I mean, I have oxen, I have flocks, I've got male, female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Uh, so he's really, really trying to butter him up here a little bit, in, in a sense, without apologizing, but in the sense saying, look, look, I've got everything I need. You know, I don't need anything that you have. I don't need your birthright. Um, God has blessed me, and I am here to serve you, and you are my Lord. In other words, I am no longer the one in charge, you're the charge. You know, you think I've stolen your birthright, but you're still the, the firstborn. You know, it's, it's yours. And he's really appeasing him to a sense. So Jacob wants these messengers to know that he's coming to his brother Esau as uh, not a master, but as a servant of Esau. This is where you see the craftiness of Jacob hidden deep in his heart, right? Because he's really playing here with words and so forth. Your servant Jacob, you know, not your master. Basically, he's sending them on to Esau to let them know that he was coming back and really doesn't need anything. And as Jacob returns, his intent was to find favor or grace in the eyes of Esau. He's not coming back to get his inheritance and, and the share of whatever his father had left him. He's a wealthy man. And then verse 6 through 8. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Yeah, I would too. If I was going home to someone I knew that didn't like me and then 400 men are coming at me, I'd be distressed and greatly afraid too. So Jacob was greatly afraid. Um, and his flocks and his herds and his camels and two into two companies, and he said, if Esau comes to the one company, attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. So the messengers return to Jacob with a message from Esau that uh, he's got 400 men. It doesn't sound like a, a welcoming party at all to Jacob. Uh, his first thoughts, I'm sure, is what do I do now? He's got 400 men coming towards me. So he's greatly fearful of the situation so he immediately divides the people and he divides his flocks his herds his camels into groups and he instructs them very clearly that if Esau attacks one camp the other camp is able to escape freely and so he's setting up this kind of line uh, where there's a division now I don't know you, you might be able to say it, it could be that he's letting Esau know that I too have many men. Here's my first group, and then you're going to meet my second group, and then my third group. It's like, how many groups does this guy have? You know, you, you could possibly read into that. Or it could be that, that as he's worried here, fearful for his family because he divides his family uh, from these groups, is that he's trying to appease him because he's going to have gifts for him too. And I, I lean towards that. So fear. Fear cripples. It, it really does. Fear cripples. I was speaking with uh, a dear friend of ours and they were sharing with me how fear cripples them. They have these anxieties and so forth and it just cripples them completely. And I was sharing um, with them this part of my message about fear and how we should not really have fear in our lives if we really know 
God and trust God completely, uh, we can be assured that God has our very life in his hands. Uh, Corey Timboon, who definitely experienced probably the worst situations in life, being in a non German Nazi camp, uh, said, worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts, whirling around a center of fear. Uh, think of that picture, <coughs> whirling around the center of fear being the center and these thoughts just all over. You know how your thoughts just go from one thing to the another, exaggeration, you know, and pulling things out of context and all these thoughts. It's just, it's just amazing how all of that is centered around fear. That's the core of it all. Fear is something that can paralyze even the bravest of persons. It is that feeling inside of you that causes you to sometimes doubt good decisions, neglect to follow through on commitments, and even become physically ill with some people. It's amazing how it will control you. And it is something that you don't oftentimes see. There are some fears that we do see, obviously, uh, that are taking place in our world. But there are those fears that are not visible at all, and they control us. Uh, A.B. Simpson said, fear is born of Satan. And, we, and if we would only take time to think a moment we would see that everything Satan says is founded upon a falsehood or a lie. Think about that for a second. Satan is a liar. From the very beginning, he lied to, to Eve. And if he's a liar, the father of lies, then fear, which Satan uses to paralyze the believer, you know, is a lie. We shouldn't have to fear. J. Vernon McGee, and I hear his voice so clearly, he says, you know, if a lion is coming at you, obviously you're going to fear it. You know, and that's a natural thing that takes place. And you can run from it, you can protect yourself from it, you can do what it takes to survive the situation. And that's a natural thing. But an unhealthy fear, an unhealthy fear is from the enemy. Most of us have experienced fear. Everyone gets gripped with fear sometime or another. Every, everyone has in, in one situation or another. Fear is that basic human emotion people experience on a daily pa basis. Uh, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of criticism, fear of being imperfect, fear of change. That's a big one, fear of change. Things need to change. Why can't we just keep it the same? It's been running pretty smooth. Let's not touch it. Fear to take risks and even fear of success. Fear confines you to your own comfort zones and prevents you from stepping out in faith sometimes. It's fear that makes you avoid risk and keeps you chained to your fears. It really does. Isaiah 35, 4 says, To them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with the recompense, he will come and save you. Now, obviously, Isaiah is in the context of battling in a war that we shouldn't fear because God is on our side. But I think that we have spiritual batters, battles, and we need to also realize that God is still on our side, and he'll get us through those spiritual battles too. He told Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong, be courageous, and do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's an encouragement to Joshua. Three times he was told that. He was told that by the Lord. He was to told that by Moses. And he was told that by the people. And Joshua may have been one of those guys that just had a depression, you know, and he needed to really be encouraged three times. And we see what Joshua did because he put his faith and trust in the Lord. Peter obviously says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He uses the word anxieties, those invisible things that we suffer, that we think will happen. And chances are it will never happen. Is there the possibility of it happening? Of course there is. One in a lifetime of maybe a hundred people in certain situations, but usually it won't happen. But that one possibility mean it may happen, and it may happen to me. And so you get all anxious over it instead of just giving it unto the Lord. As Peter says, casting it onto the Lord. 
And if you think that anybody is going to frighten me, you don't know me at all, Billy Sunday said, as he was a great evangelist preaching to millions. So he wasn't fearful at all because he put his faith and trust in the Lord. Jacob is greatly fearful and he is distressed in this situation. And what he needs to do is put his faith and trust in God. And God's going to put him in a situation in a moment here where we're going to see that he's going to force him to trust in God. So Jacob now is going to inquire of God uh, <clears throat> to fulfill his promises. Um, he's kind of at a, in a place where, where he's now going to cry out to God. Okay, uh, I'm not in a good situation. 400 men are coming at me. So what do I need to do? I need to go seek God right now. And I need to remind him of the promises he made so that he can really protect me. He may have forgotten you know, and so I want to remind him of these things. So Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff. And now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitudes. So after requesting peace and reacting in panic here, Jacob resorts to that prayer. And we find him praying to God, the God of his father, Abraham, and Isaac. And his prayer basically is very clear cut as he reminds God that you promised that I would be a great nation as the sands of the sea. You said you would be with me. You said that you would protect me. He also reminded God that I'm nobody. He said in verse 10, I am not worthy. And literally in the Greek, it's I am little. I am little, I have no strength at all, and I am the least, and I need mercy. I need mercy completely. God, I'm afraid. Deliver me from my brother. I love the honesty of Jacob here. He's being very honest with the Lord, and he's asking and crying out for help. I think when we come to God, we need to be totally honest with him. He already knows our fears. He already knows the situation, and we need to be honest with him. And just say, Lord, I'm fearful in this situation, and I just need your strength. This morning, uh, and, and probably the last couple of mornings, I've been going live on Facebook with these devotions. And I tell you, as soon as that camera goes on, it just, I start shaking. I'm like, why am I shaking? You know, I've been doing this for a while now with everyone here, and I feel comfortable, and I enjoy it, and just talking with everybody. And, and all, as soon as that camera went, I'm like, started shaking. I'm like, why am I shaking like that? This Sunday I'll be gone. Um, I'm going to be teaching at another church, and I'm freaking out. You know, I'm just like I got a study, and, and and I got the study in my head that I think the Lord wants me to to share. But it's like I'm like I, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm just like I'm. I hate going out. I hate going to other places. I love staying here and being comfortable and just doing what I do every Sunday without anything else. And, and you know, and this message is getting to me. Like I got to stop that. But yet I'm shaking. You know, and so I'm honest with God. God, I don't like this. I don't love it. You know, I don't want to do it. I really don't. If you can get me out of this, you know, I would really appreciate it. But when a good friend asks you, you know, you don't want to say no. You just don't want to say no. And so you have to be honest with the Lord. And then, and then from there, you really do. You just, you just leave it in his hands. You take a breath and you just go in there and say, okay, Lord, hopefully you can use this as best as you can. So Jacob is reminding God of his promise, and if he is killed, God, um, how can your promise, you know, come true if I'm dead? So that must mean that I don't die. You know, you have to protect me. And it's wonderful to pray on the basis of God's promises. If God has promised us something, we can hold him accountable to that. Uh, it helps to strengthen us when you know that God's promises 
uh, are true and he is faithful to keep those promises. And that's how Jacob is coming. He's coming by faith to the Lord. He's pushing and saying, this is what you promised. And I'm just going to continue to believe what you said. And so my second point, faith continues. Faith continues. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, the English word faith is used of belief. With the predominant idea of trust or even confidence. Whether in God or in Christ, it springs from faith. And faith is always in something tangible, like Jesus Christ or God. You know that they exist, they are beings, and in this case, they are, they are deity, and you can put your faith in them because you know by experience and by facts through the word of God that they have power, and they have authority, and they can get things done. So it's not like you're putting your faith in something blind. Uh, something that doesn't exist, but it's something with, with substantial evidence. Faith means trust, confidence, even assurance and belief. Assurance that you serve a mighty God. Hebrews 11 in the Bible is known as the Hall of Faith. And in that chapter, you, you, you hear all these wonderful men and women of faith and what they endured and yet they all had faith and trust in God. He tells us in verse 1, probably the best uh, place to find a definition of faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Though we don't see the results, though we don't see very well the situation, we know that we trust in a God who sees all things. And it's very clear that he sees all things as we read his word. And we see how he delivers the children of Israel time after time after time in the Old Testament. And how he has delivered Jesus. And I think the ultimate thing is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That God could resurrect him from the dead. That's some power. It is also the book and chapter uh, that we can review for those um, of faith such as Abraham and Isaac and even Jacob is listed there with many others as men of faith. Uh, faith is trust, assurance, and even confidence in God that I have the confidence that God knows my situation and I don't have to fear. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be anxious because God knows my confidence. Uh, the day and the hour and the second that God decides to take me home, that's his plan, and that is for his glory. And I have confidence that when that happens, that he'll take care of even that. And if it means suffering, then so be it. Let me suffer for the glory of God. Now just read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you can read some glorious sufferings for the Lord Jesus Christ as they're being burnt on crosses, as they're being tarred, as they're being killed for the glory of God. And yet, the whole time as they're going through this, they're praising God completely. They're not denying their faith because they have confidence in God. Our home is not here. It's temporal. We have an eternal home, a mansion that is awaiting us, and God is going to come back and rapture us out to go there one day. If he doesn't do that and he takes us home, then so be it. So we shouldn't fear what man can do to the body, but fear God who can kill the soul. John really encourages us in 1 John 5, 4, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And if you're a born-again believer and you put your faith and trust in God and you understand the scriptures to be true and the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, then you know that as a child of God, you have overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, John said. It is our faith. It is our faith. And so that's something to be said about faith and having faith, trusting in God, being assured in God, and having confidence in God. That is what faith is. A.W. Tozer said, Let God be true, but every man a liar is the language of true faith. Think about that one for a second, because you can almost apply that to a lot of things. Let God be true, 
Okay, in what, in what situation? It doesn't matter. In any situation, let God be true and every man a liar. You can't do that. But God told me I can. Well, I'm going to believe God because man's a liar. I'm going to trust in God because man's a liar. <clears throat> I don't think I can overcome this situation. And God says you've conquered the world. Yeah, but I'm telling myself that I just can't do it. It's, it's too big for me. It's too much for me. You're a liar. God is true. Believe him. You got to believe him. It's putting your total faith in God. Matthew 8:26 gives us the the storm story of Jesus and and the disciples in that boat. You remember that story and Jesus said to them while they were in the boat, you know, why are you afraid, oh you of little faith? So he ties faith and fears together. Because your faith is little, you fear. If your faith was big, you wouldn't fear. It's very clear what he's saying here. You have little faith, so you have fear. Increase your faith and you won't have fear. Increase your confidence and trust and assurance of God and you won't fear. And then what did he do? He increased their faith. How? He, re he rose, he rebuked the winds and the sea and everything was calm. And they're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> like, What were we worried about? Jesus is with us in the boat. I don't have to worry. George Mueller said, to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. I have, learned man, I have learned my faith by standing firm amid severe testings. Wow. If testings come, it could be because God's trying to build your faith. He will get you through those testings. He will give you the victory of those testings. You will learn lessons of those testings. No matter how long that testing will be, it will build your faith. It will build your faith. You and I can stand on God's promises. We are children of a father who loves us. His love and his plan for us will be fulfilled. And we can trust him. I know it's hard. <sighs> I still dealing with this injury. You know, there are days where I have great days and I guess injuries are like that I'm learning where all of a sudden you think, wow, I feel so good. Let me go do something. You know, and then you realize, okay, I wasn't so good the next day and now here I am for a week later and you go, man, I thought I was better. Eight years, you know, eight years, Lord. And you realize that, okay, this is the way you want me to live and I have to have faith that your grace is sufficient for me and that what I do and am able to do is all that you want from me at this time. And that takes faith to trust in God instead of dwelling upon your situation. Yeah, it takes trials sometimes to build our faith. Esau, or I'm sorry, Jacob's faith is being built right now. God is taking this opportunity to build it, but it's not there yet. And one of the things that, that Esau, I'm sorry, Jacob is really known for is what? Running. He loves to run away from things, right? He, j he just likes to get away. I'm just not going to participate. I'm just not going to go that way. I'm just going to go over here for a while and I'm just going to spend some time here. You know, Esau's after me. Okay, let me run away and let me go to Laban for a while. Now Esau's going to confront me. So probably what's in his thoughts was, okay, how do I get, maybe I don't go home. Maybe I'm going to go another route and find another way. He's already divided his, his camp. And so God's going to stop that uh, in his life, running away by crippling him. But let's look at Jacob uh, trying to handle things still in his own ways, verse 13 through 21. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats, uh, 20 male goats, 200 ewe lambs, 20 rams, uh, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance uh, between successive droves. So there, there were many groups. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and ask you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Uh, whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant 
Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. And so he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the presence that goes before me, and afterwards I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the presence went on be over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So you see what Jacob is doing there? He divided his men from his family. He, he pitched his tent there in Manharim, and he waited there for his brother Esau. Meanwhile, he's gathering these gifts, and he's going to bring presents to them. And the idea was, you know, I can let him know, first, I'm wealthy, but that it's his. That this is an offering, a peace offering, in a sense, to him. And he reminds the servants, make sure every one of you, when you meet him, make sure you tell him this is from Jacob, his servant, his servant, you know, over and over again. So as they're doing this, Jacob is camped out there, and his family crosses over this brook. Look at verse 22, 23. And he arose that night and took two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the Ford brook. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. So he's protecting his family here. He's a good husband. He's a good father. And good husbands and fathers always protect their loved ones. He protects both Leah, Zalpha, Rachel, and Baha'i. All his wives. He protects all his children. Reuben, Ishakar, Dan, Gad, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Neptulon, Asher, Zebulon, and even Joseph. Well, minus Benjamin, but Benjamin's not born yet until later on. But these are his precious gifts from God and so he's going to do whatever he takes and so he sends them over the ford there the little shallow area there that goes through the brooks so they're able to cross over in that little area and find some safety and then he goes to be alone verse 24 through 29 Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day now when he saw that he had not prevailed against him he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. I just thought of this. Jacob saw God face to face. He was not the greatest of God's people, right? <laughs> and he got to see God's face to face. I mean, he was a conniver, a deceiver, a manipulator, a thief. And he got to see God's face. You, you just scratch your head and go, I don't understand sometimes, God, the people you use. You know, you would think that it'd be someone like David, you know, when he earlier years you know, where he's out tending the flock and being faithful to his father and, and so forth, and then comes and destroys Goliath, you know, this young man's faithful to Saul and just in his humility and not, you know, um, um, overrunning his kingdom, knowing that God is calling him to be king. You know, not David's later life, though, but you just go, wow, that's the man you would think God would choose, you know, Noah, and, you know, and then, but Jacob, and then he gets to see God face to face, you know, David didn't even see God face to face, but he got to see God face to face. And you just go, I don't know, I don't even know what to think of it right now. You know, just kind of like, Lord, is there, there's hope for us, I guess, you know. Um, one day we'll all see God face to face when we get to heaven, and that will be wonderful, but 
wow, how God works. I mean, it just reminds me of Corinthians, that he chooses you know, the weak things of this world. Uh, why? So they don't get glory, so that God gets glory. Because if anything good comes out of this, then it has to be God and no one else. I love this narrative of Jacob because he's wrestling with God. I don't know how many times have you wrestled with God in the middle of the night, got on your knees. I can count probably a good five, six, seven times in my life where I've really wrestled with God. Recently wrestling with God, just several weeks ago, I remember a time where I was wrestling with God in the middle of the night, Virginia wakes up and what are you doing? And I'm on the floor just rocking and just praying and seeking God. Times when the enemy's right over me with a demon ready to stab me with a dagger as Virginia describes this this vision uh, of the enemy wanting to destroy me and just many times where you're wrestling you know with God and Jacob here is wrestling with God though they're not always fun and exciting moments in your life sometimes there are great struggles but you look back and you go I was wrestling with God I was literally wrestling with God. He was there, and we were reasoning one with another, trying to figure things out, and he was faithful enough to wrestle with me, to spend time with me. How do we know that it was God that Jacob was wrestling? Hosea gives us insight to this chapter here in chapter 12, verse 4. It says, yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept. And he sought favor from him. This was a struggle of weeping and crying and of battling and sweat and just, you know, it was, it was a battle that he needed to prevail through. And in verse 5, he says, that is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his name. And so Hosea tells us that the angel was the Lord of, of hosts. It was the Lord God that he wrestled with. Now, you know, and I know, that's not a match. <laughs> How do you intend to win something like that? But in Jacob's mind, here's this man, and he wants to wrestle as we start to wrestle. He does realize in verse 28 when he um, changes his name, he says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God. And it's very clear that he wrestled with God. Jacob is alone, and God wrestles with him until morning this was a long wrestle his battle gets interesting here Jacob will not give up he has a tenacity and I think it's tenacity uh, not in the sense of pride and arrogance I think it's of surrender here though and I think we need to understand that to fight he, he wants something and he wants deliverance from it and he's not letting go until he gets it uh, to the point where God literally says, that's it. And he just touches his hip. Uh, they say the socket of the hip. And he crippled him from that point on. And he had to walk for the rest of his life in a, with a cane. Jacob is in pain. He's crippled. He can't run anymore. And he surrendered completely to the Lord. He was now defeated Jacob's plan was probably to run if everything else failed, but God says, no, your plan now is to stay and have faith in me. So God brought Jacob to the place of total surrender as he weeps and prays for God's blessing. At this moment, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, which means ruled by God. He'll catch her to ruled by God. And I think all of us, all of us totally understand that name change because at one time or another, we were heel catcher and God changed our name to ruled by God. And I'm not saying your name was changed, but your character was changed. Your personality is being changed. God took you from what you were and he's making you into something else, to a person that is surrendered to the will of the Lord. That, that, is, that's, that almost should be a point in my message is that we need to be people, Christians need to be people that are surrendered to the will of the Lord. You don't see that quite often anymore. You don't see it in husbands and wives and in families. 
You need to see people who, who understand that if I read this book and God is directing me and even describing to me my role as an individual, then I need to fulfill that role because that's the role that he's given to me. And so it's my responsibility now as a Christian to say, my old life was, who cares about that role? The culture doesn't care. They've created all kinds you know, of roles for people. A husband's role, uh, it, it all depends on who you are. That husband's role could be, we don't want you in the home. Get out so we can collect money from the state. That's of you. So a husband just comes in, plants a seed, and then moves so they can collect money. A husband's role is, you're here, but don't lead us. I'm the leader. You do what I say. That's another view of a husband. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible tell us about the role of a husband? And then that husband needs to say, but I'm going to follow the Bible. And the Bible tells me as a husband, I'm to lead this family in prayer, in worship, and in reading of the word, and taking to church, and being responsible for the things that I have. Same goes with a wife. Same goes with the family as husbands and wife. You're to take care of the family God has given you. These are your responsibilities. When you surrender to God, you become ruled by God and those rules that God has for us. And I'm not saying in the legal sense of rule, but rules being in the sense of the spiritual rules of the new life in Christ Jesus. You're a new Christian. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so things like, you know, drinking, that's like, I don't need that no more. There's no place for it in my life. You know, I have other things to be filled with, to be intoxicated with. Those are the things that we should be fulfilling in our lives because our names have been changed. Our very character has been changed. You have been born again. You're no longer that old creature. So behold, all things become new to you like the new name. So everything becomes new when you are. I think there are a lot of people out there, and, and I don't, I'm not judging hearts. I can't judge hearts. That's God. But you look at the fruit, and you just have to ask yourself, are they really Christians? Do they really understand what surrendering to God means? Because it doesn't seem like it by the way that they act, by the way that they talk, by the things that they're doing. And you see the evidence very clear. No, we are new creatures. Jacob is new, and he's going to be ruled by God. He was once a, a person that manipulated, but now he's a person ruled by God completely. Jacob then asked him, well, what's your name? <laughs> and, and I think that's a perfect example of what we've been talking about. You know, God says, why do you have to ask? <laughs> Why don't you just know? Hmm. You get my point? He had to literally ask, but if you truly are surrendered to God, you don't have to ask. You know it's God. Because the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice and they follow me. They follow me. Yeah. So if Jesus was to command us to do something, we, we follow that voice. We listen and we obey like a child in your home when your parent says son i want you to get up in the morning every tuesday i want you before you do anything else go out to the side of the house take the trash cans and put them down to the front of the curb so the trash man can pick it up and that son says you got it dad but then of course tuesday morning comes and they forget about it and there you are an hour later going to the side of the house getting the trash cans and putting them down that son has not heard your voice, nor is he following your voice. When Jesus said, they hear my voice and they follow, that means they do it because they hear the voice of the Lord. There are two sons that Jesus talks about, and one is told to do, both are told to do something. One of them says, sure, I'll go do it, but he never does it. The other one says, ah, oh, I don't have time. Oh. It's kind of like, ah, oh, I don't want to. But then he realizes it's something that I should do because my father asked me to, so he goes and does it. You see, he still hears his voice, though he doesn't have the right attitude. He hears his voice, and he does it anyway. That is a converted soul. So what's, what's your name? 
Like, you got to ask? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So Jacob called the place for I have seen God face to face. <clears throat> the great preacher uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, once asked, what does a person look like who has truly met God? And he was referring to this, this scripture here in Genesis. And he said, he walks with a limp. Isn't that good? He's been broken. He's crippled. He has no strength of his own. He's totally dependent on the Lord. So Jacob limps away. As a reminder, look at verse 31 and 32. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. So what a reminder, right? I mean, just let us remember what happened to Jacob, but they forget that teaching there of humility and surrenderedness to God. They forget it completely. So my last point, faith surrenders. Faith surrenders. Many times we find ourselves wrestling with God over all kinds of situations and God is dealing with us on issues and we begin to wrestle with them and not wanting to surrender because we want to do what we want to do. Interesting that it, that is exactly what an atheist wants. He wants to do what he wants to do. Uh, he doesn't care about anything else. God was wrestling with Jacob to bring him to a place of surrender so that he can do all that he wants to do through that man. But Jacob was one of these tough guys, tough nut to crack. Surrender and submission in today's world, those are words that usually have a negative Condentation, right? Surrender? No, we never surrender. You know, it's it's a negative submission. No, I'll never submit. I, I used to wrestle with my brother, and being the older one, I was bigger than him, so I usually would win. And the way that I would win, and I was literally sit on his chest, and I take my knuckle like this, and I'd start banging on his chest, and I go, "You give, you give." You give, and he's like, no, I don't give. And he's like trying to get away. I don't give. And I just kept banging on his chest like that. And fine, all right, I give. You know? But we don't want to give up. You know, we'll do whatever it takes to not submit ourselves, not surrender, right? Especially men. That's not where God wants us. He wants us to have hearts that surrender to him and to his will. What those words mean to mean is to voluntarily put yourself under the command or mission of another. If the one you're submitted to is good, then nothing but good with, will result from that surrender. And if God is good and we surrender to him, then we know that, that everything that comes from that is going to be good. It's going to be good for us because God has us in mind. God is good all the time. And he wants us to surrender so that he can bless us all the time. All the time. There's a story in 2 Kings 7.3. You may have remember it. The, um, there was a battle going on. The Syrians were camped out. Mighty men. Two leopards. I'm sorry, four leprous men were in the hills there looking down. And they're like, what do we do? There's, the, there's the, all these guys out there and warriors and we're up here and we're leprous and so forth what do we do and they start talking to each other well you know if we sit up here nobody wants us back there we'll probably end up dying so why just sit here and do nothing why don't we go down there and who knows they might accept us and and then we're saved and we're okay but if they kill us then hey we're gonna die anyway so let's just go down and, and you see that what they were doing was battling on what to do surrendering to the will of the lord and they finally decided, let's just surrender and let's just go down there and see what the Lord does. If he kills us, fine. Just like the three Hebrew children, right? Who go in the fire and if, hey, the Lord, he can save us if he wants. But if he doesn't, that's fine too. They had total faith in him. And they went down there and apparently the Syrians thought that chariots were coming and they whew, scattered out of the place and these leprous men went down there and boom, nothing but wealth and, and so forth. And they were able to take it back. 
But that's what surrendering does. When you surrender to God, God has a wonderful plan through it all, blessings that will take place. D.L. Moody said, let God have your life. He can do more with it than you can. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true, what God can do with a life. And do great things with that life compared to what you can do with that life when you surrender to him. I never would have thought I'd go to South Sudan. Someone that's not saved, they're like, why would I want to go to South Sudan? <laughs> What's in South Sudan? But you know, you're preaching to hundreds of guys and gospels going out and you're ministering to people and you're like, man, this is awesome. <laughs> this is a great thing. Never would have wondered. See, God can do greater things than we can imagine when we're totally surrendered to him. There's an atheist. His name is Christopher Hitchens. He was born in England. He was an American here. <clears throat> he wrote for Vanity Fair, World Affair, Atlantic, and various books like that. He wrote, wrote a book called God is Not Great. So totally, total atheist. So I'm using it as an example. So bear with me. God is not great. How religion poisons everything, right? And that's the claim of, of atheists, but they forget you know, what atheism has done with Stalin and Marx and all those, you know, they don't believe in God and the millions that they've killed. Let me make sure that's in the tape here. <laughs> you know, because what religion does compared to atheism is nothing, nothing compared to atheism. But he wrote this about faith. Faith is the surrender of the mind. It's the surrender of reason. It's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other animals. It's our need to believe and to surrender our skepticism and our reason, our yearning to discard that and put all our trust or faith in someone or something that is, that is the sinister thing to me. Out of all the virtues, all the supposed virtues, faith must be the most overrated. Well, so you see, he doesn't like faith at all, especially putting your faith in God is his point here. What he's saying is not true. It is not true because you see, faith does not abandon reason. It does not abandon the mind. On the contrary, it is our very function of mind and reason that convinces us to put our faith and trust in God who has control over all things. We are, so we logically choose to trust God. We don't believe in a myth. We don't believe in Greek mythology as gods and that were written by men. We believe in a true and living God, a historical God who walked among us. We have more documents pertaining to Jesus than we do of Caesar, and yet we so easily believe that there is a Caesar who dwelt in Rome. But we don't Jesus because he's religious. But there's more documents and evidence of him walking among us. Many secular historians write about him. And of course, the Bible writes about him. And they write that he claimed to be God in the flesh. Even Paul said that he was God in flesh in the book of 1 Timothy. Very clear who Jesus was. And so it's not that we believe in a fairy tale. It's not that we believe in some myth, some storytelling. These are factual evidence and proof that we believe in a true and living God, a historical God, and one that has existed from eternity. And so it is a faith that we can surrender to logically. A.W. Tozer said, the man or woman who is hol holy or jealous, joyously surrendered to Christ can make a wrong choice. Any choice will be the right one, or can't make a wrong choice. Any choice will be the right one. Let me say that again because I don't want you to miss that. The man or woman who is holy or joyously surrendered to Christ can't make a wrong choice because any choice will be the right one. In other words, when you are surrendered to Christ completely, then your mind will be God's mind. 
your will will desire his will. And so when you ask, you're going to ask for the things that would please God. And so you can't ask wrongly. You can't request wrongly because you wouldn't ask for those things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for a mansion. I wouldn't ask for a you know, Mercedes-Benz or a Rolls-Royce. It's like, that's ridiculous. You know, I don't need that. I would ask, Lord, just that you provide. Let me close. <coughs> Andrew Murray said, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to him. I like that. God is ready. And if we're willing to just surrender to him, he will take that life and he'll do great things. Don't fear. God has a work to be done. He wants to do it through you if you'll surrender to him. And if you won't, he loves you enough to cripple you and to bring you to a point where you surrender to him too. But don't let that happen. Surrender, him, sur surrender to him joyfully and just be used by God. Let's pray.